This is the Bible in one year, day 35. Seven characteristics of a good leader. Leadership is influence, writes John Maxwell, whose organizations have trained more than one million leaders worldwide. He points out that according to sociologists, even the most isolated individual will influence 10,000 other people during his or her lifetime. In one sense, there is only one leader. In our New Testament reading today, Jesus says, There is only one life leader for you, Christ. On the other hand, every Christian is called to be a leader in the sense that other people will look to you as an example. You have influence over others in different ways. To be called by God to influence others is an enormous privilege, and it comes with great responsibility. From Psalm 18 Confidence David was a leader who had confidence. However, it's not self-confidence, but confidence in God. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. David recognized that he needed God for first protection. He's a shield for all who take refuge in him. You protect me with salvation armor. Second, strength. It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. Third training, he trains my hands for battle. It was as I was reading this verse back in 1992 that I realized the need to train our small group hosts and helpers before each alpha began. Fourth guidance, you, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. Lord, I need your help. I pray for your protection, strength, and guidance. Lead me in your perfect way. New Testament from Matthew 23 Character Jesus attacks the religious leaders of his day with strong language. You snakes! You brood of vipers! This language would have come as a complete shock. They were highly regarded, respectable people. The scribes were lawyers. They preserved and interpreted the law. They were authorized to act as judges. They had been ordained after a course of study. They were experts in the scriptures. They were teachers who gathered pupils around them. The Pharisees were lay people. They tended to come from the middle classes, unlike the Sadducees, who were more aristocratic. They were much respected for their piety. They prayed and fasted regularly. They attended the service. They gave regularly. They led upright, moral lives. They had a big influence in society. They were much admired by ordinary people. Yet, Jesus criticizes them for being hypocrites. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polished veneer. Jesus' seven woes challenge me to aspire to seven characteristics of a good leader. First, integrity. Jesus attacks the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He says they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Integrity is the opposite of this. It means practicing what you preach and making sure that your words lift people up rather than weighing them down with guilt or other burdens. Second, authenticity. Jesus attacks their superficiality. He says to them, Everything they do is done for others to see. But what matters is who you are when nobody is looking. Jesus speaks about your secret life with God. Seek to develop an authentic, private life with God. Third, humility. Jesus warns against loving titles and recognition. Be on your guard so that you're not enticed by prominent positions, public flattery, and being given titles of one sort or another. Jesus warns, don't let people do that to you. Put you on a pedestal like that. This is such a temptation, but Jesus says, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Always seek to exalt Jesus rather than yourself. Fourth, compassion. Jesus attacks the religious leaders for putting stumbling blocks in the way of others. He says, you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Leaders need to have the opposite spirit, one that is open and welcoming to everyone. 
Jesus himself sets an example of compassion. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. Fifth vision. Leaders should have big vision. Jesus attacks the small-minded and pettiness of the religious leaders, the ridiculous hair-splitting. They could not see the wood for the trees. Concentrate on the important issues. Pray for God's vision and don't be sidetracked. Ask God to give you a vision that is so big that without him it is impossible. Sixth, focus. Focus on what really matters. Avoid getting caught up with minor details and becoming legalistic. Jesus says, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Rather focus on the more important matters. Justice, mercy and faithfulness. Fight against racism and every other kind of injustice. Champion the poor and demonstrate faithfulness in your relationships with your family and others. Seventh, generosity. This is the opposite of the greed and self-indulgence which Jesus decries. Their inner life is so different from the outer life. Jesus calls you to be yourself, for the inside to be like the outside. These are extremely high standards and very hard to attain. Jesus' words here, as the woes come to a climax, are some of the strongest to come from his mouth. It's important to note that they were not addressed to ordinary people. Jesus was criticizing powerful leaders who were seeking to exalt themselves and who shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Don't use the words of Jesus as an excuse to berate ordinary people or even leaders who are genuinely seeking to point people to Jesus. I need to direct them at myself. These are challenging words, but the challenge should not be directed at the wrong people. What is so amazing about Jesus' words is that, humanly speaking, he was in a position of great weakness, and yet he was not afraid to take on the powers of his day. Lord, forgive me for the times that I've failed in these areas. Help me to lead a life of integrity, authenticity, humility, compassion, vision, focus, and generosity. Help me to have the same concern for my city as Jesus had for his. Old Testament from Job 33 and 34 Criticism. As Rick Warren has pointed out, criticism is the cost of influence. As long as you don't influence anybody, nobody's going to say a peep about you. But the greater your influence, the more critics you're going to have. Poor Job, who was in a prominent position of leadership, has to put up with a constant tirade of abuse from his so-called friends. Criticism is always hardest when it comes from those who should be our friends. It's sad when unjustified criticism of Christian leaders comes from within the church itself, from the so-called friends. It must have been extremely galling for Job to have to listen to Elihu, who was much younger and yet convinced of his own experience, arrogantly saying to Job, I will teach you wisdom, and Job speaks without knowledge, his words lack insight. And to suggest that because he disagreed with his critics, to his sin, he adds rebellion against God. Elihu, like so many critics, claims to be carefully thought out and have no ulterior motives. He claims that others agree with him. All right-thinking people say, and the wise who've listened to me concur. Job is an ignoramus. He talks utter nonsense. I, too, can easily fall into the trap of judging God's people on a superficial basis, just as Elihu does. Beware of the dangers of criticizing others. Although it's been pointed out that no one ever built a monument to a critic, it does not stop us all wanting to be critics. Be very careful of what you say about other people. And, if you're on the receiving end of criticism, don't be surprised. Lord, help me to avoid passing superficial judgments on other people. Give me wisdom and sensitivity towards those who are struggling with life. Help me to fix my eyes on the one true leader, Jesus to come under his lordship and follow his example. Pepper adds, As I don't have much physical strength, I love all these verses that say, With my God I can scale a wall. It is God who arms me with strength. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. 
he gives us his saving help, which is my shield. His right hand sustains me. All these verses in Psalm 18 help me when I'm feeling weary and physically not on top of things. These words are really encouraging.